back in all this time. So you will see the uh, advertisement about this event and it will be great that you could also join because in around two hours, you will be able to listen to 20 people that have contributed in a very strong way to the history of IAC. Um, in fact, today we have uh, an UPAMA that also has been collaborating in the past with IAC in the several initiatives. Um, Anupama is uh, an architect from India, as you know, she graduated from the University in Mumbai uh, in 1989, and she received a PhD uh, from the TU, TU Berlin in 2008. Uh, so her research is oriented to, to and, and the practice uh, has generated a people-centric architecture based on spatial and material research for uh, low environmental impact while being socio-economical beneficial. No? Her body of work is currently exhibited at, as a solo show taking time at Luciano Museum of Modern Art in Denmark until April, April uh, the 5th. She has taught architecture and urban management at various international universities uh, and right now she's a professor at Potsdam School of Architecture in Germany. In the past, uh, we were collaborating in several projects and I'm sure that it, she will be sharing some of these collaborations. So Anupama, thank you. It's a great pleasure to have uh, you with us again. And the screen is yours. Okay, thank you so much. I'm gonna to try to share the screen. Uh right now and check that technologically everything is fine um and i hope i'm taking the right thing yeah we can see your screen you can see something and now i will see some breaks want to start here and then I want to go to the full screen. It all worked? Yes. Yeah, okay, perfect. great. So, entire team who have invited me here. Oh my God, I've quit it or what? No, no, you are there. You are still here. Uh, Fabio, do you do you think we? Oh, have can a you hear me? Now, yes. Try again. Uh, I have to share once again. Uh, Fabia, she disconnected. Yeah, she is. Yeah, she is having some connection issues. That's why we mean. She told us that she's in Germany. And. Uh, I'm not, yeah, no, yeah, he's here, he's here. I'm not even in India, so I don't know what why it happened. But uh, <laughs> oh my God, I hope it works now. Let me see. Um. Okay. Yes. Okay, everybody, please cross your fingers. I don't know what happened. Um, so thanks so much. And um, I've, I've purposely called this uh, lecture slow architecture. Okay, it's not because I want to, I know everybody's hurrying, hurrying up, hurrying up. Okay, nowadays, because we're talking about rapid urbanization, we are talking about huge urban transformations and all that. But the thing is that uh, we shouldn't be making shortcuts in the thinking of architecture. And in the, we, we do need to slow down enough that we are actually using our human faculties to, to think before we act. You know? And I'm uh, going to explain this term throughout the lecture, what I mean by slowing. I do not mean delaying at all. 
I mean that if you invest the human time in knowledge and uh, informed action, then we will notice that probably time is a very underrated resource um, that can be actually put um, to the service of uh, producing innovation as opposed to uh, you know, the past hundred years where we spoke about industrialization and uh, time-saving devices. Uh, uh, always when we save time, we felt it's a more efficient design. And I want to actually say that instead of trying to rush about and save time, my question is what are we doing with all the time that we are saving? Are we putting it necessarily to advance ourselves? You know, And I want to um, explore, I want to share with you my own experiences after discovering that time is a very, very important resource that everybody has, whether you're rich or poor, everybody has 24 hours in the day, no matter which part of the world we live. And maybe everybody can unblock this resource for the collective good. I want to uh, build a little bit the context of what is going on today in the world uh, in the name of rapid urbanization and why I came to this direction. Um, and in fact, to explain what my three decades uh, of work as an architect that is shown in Louisiana right now, um, explores a bit also the context of where I come from. I was, uh, I grew up in Bombay, you know, mega city. It's one of those so-called places like China that India is in the so-called rapid urbanization, but actually alone China and India, we are one third of the world's population, but all the other countries are also, that are now only developing, are following models that could be actually more problematic than they are solving. So I wanted to explain a little bit the skyline of what architecture today is, looks like, okay? And what kind of complex, social, environmental, and economic problems we are probably creating through architecture rather than solving. Uh, because the post-industrialized model of housing in developing countries, developed countries, that has to do with the glass tower, um, has been put in all parts of the world. And we have defined a, a certain new normal after industrial ways of doing things, while the rest of the world has not yet been mainstream industrialized. And there are larger consequences of some habits of, of, uh, that we created in this time. And in that context, uh, also I would include, like you see this kind of messy skyline where you have three skylines actually in the same city, one middle one, which is a slow growing peripheral architecture in areas where um, development control rules are not yet in place. This is like the outskirts of Delhi. And then you see the new gated communities or the commodified housing, which is developer driven and it is the way housing is being provided worldwide. Uh, and, and in order to build those, people are migrating from villages because there's such a huge economic activity and that those people who are migrating are going to build this, the informal settlements that you see in the foreground. And we are not looking at all these problems as man-made constructs, actually, that we are, ourselves have created it because we did not zoom out and see the whole situation that we are creating. So this kind of things, which used to preoccupy uh, me when I was studying architecture and I graduated early on, I started paying more and more attention to some of those concerns and noticing the polarized polarization that technologies can create also um, in, in the way cities manifest and uh, how incredibly intertwined the two polarized sectors of society are and uh, and all these issues of affordability and um, climate change related 
uh, questioning of urban materiality, it has to do with this kind of extremes, you know. And um, so at that time when I was just graduating, I used to worry, this, was, this is not, this is a quote I have taken uh, from Peter Drucker to explain what was going on in my mind, to explain the rest of my approach, that there is nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. You know, I used to ask myself that all this busy, 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 you know, creating of a lot of things which everybody agreed that they didn't like, but they were still creating in a certain way as if we cannot stop the momentum and, and start creating anything different. Because, um, you know, if you create a, like the more sensitive practice was being swallowed by the large industry, the large supply chains. And uh, it, 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 it felt like, you know, one shouldn't be investing time in, in the personalized way of the small architecture studio um, in, in the future as if it were irrelevant. So with those kind of thoughts, I'm sharing with you a little bit also my personal journey, you know, and, uh, and to see why I made certain personal choices and how my career then unfolded out of these kind of questions that I dedicated my time to. So, you know, some of the issues that concern us uh, and when we talk about sustainability, I realized um, have to do with not immediately if a building is sustainable or whatever is, uh, however sustainability is being defined as, uh, you know, is this material good or bad? Is this, um, uh, what is the footprint of, uh, of, of, of a particular decision? But there are, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to just mention a couple of strategies that I learned um, or I realized are important in the holistic view of how I thought things ought to be done. And one of these things is the zooming out and looking at the big picture where you understand migration, the, the, the largeness of the city, the way infrastructure is planned. So in a city like Bombay, there are certain things you cannot do if the larger organization of the metabolism of the city itself is not being rethought. So, so there is that large scale uh, understanding as one strategy. And if you just, you know, if you compare uh, just uh, as a provocative uh, image, I have uh, taken this picture to explain how um, the materiality um, related to architecture in the in the former times, regardless where in the world we're talking about, architecture architecture's relevance in a place always was uh, had a direct relationship with the material that was uh, in the context. And the refinement that uh, architectural uh, expressions were given were had to do with how the human engaged with the material and the, how, how crudely or how refined um, people worked with the material. The, you know, luxury was not only about, about the material and how much it costs. It was about how much time people spent with it and how they carefully um, in measured uh, degrees um, applied their, their own engagement, you know, or, or in the proportions in all those invisible aspects of architecture that you cannot measure, but you know are important. So if compared to this, if you just look, look at the big, like you just zoom out a little bit and look where we are going today with materials. So I, I mean, I, when I talk about zooming out, I'm talking about zooming out in, in, the, in terms of uh, geographical place context, but also in time. And then you get to see um, that uh, a lot of local cultures, see a lot of um, traditional, I don't want to use the word actually traditional, let's say indigenous or, or local wisdom of building 
um, alongside you know how we had diversity in local cultures, languages, etc. We had also so many various ways of building um, according to what was available in a geographical context. So in today, today there is a, a huge sense of uniformity and even uh, high energy materials like reinforced cement concrete or steel or aluminum, all of these materials are like the new vernacular everywhere. It, it is something that is assumed that it can only be built like that. And even you see the piles of brick uh, that you see um, are also there. They are not even allowed to be load bearing in most of the countries. They are not allowed to be, um, it, they are not often allowed in the norms to carry weight, etc. So I, I do want to call for a little bit of, uh, of courageously looking at where we are and where we were only 100 years ago or so. Um, in order to sort of find pointers as to how the future could look like. In any case, we know the consequence of this decision. I'm, I mean, it's nothing to judge um, steel, cement, concrete, because they are very, very uh, huge advances and advancements we have made with these technologies, and we need it in the age of climate change all the more. But not every single park bench needs to be made out of these materials, you know, which is because, because of habit. So similarly, um, if one looks at urban rural migration and migration due to various reasons, whether it's globalization related um, job opportunities or whether it's due to political reasons, now we are at a different point where everybody moves into a city and people need houses as it were from scratch. In, in former times, when our ancestors passed on, they left their things behind. And uh, you see the old cities, uh, even in Europe, that they, whatever was built by our forefathers, they are still val uh, usable. And so we didn't need to meet, build, build these kind of quantities even. So, uh, so one of the, um, the next strategies that I would like to highlight is, is actually the importance of looking at local building materials and local building as looking at um, what is available locally with new eyes. I mean, critically examining what is local material and what is uh, an appropriate building technology. I personally discovered when I uh, spent, uh, I, I dropped out of Bombay and I moved to a rural area and I started discovering all the invisible activities uh, that I got, they became more and more visible to me once I started roaming around and discovered through the non-industrial way of making things uh, like for example, bricks, how the oven is itself the, the stack of bricks that are going to be cooked is also the oven, you know, or there were very clever, uh, intelligent processes that took many lifetimes to develop. They were being very easily replaced. And I found, for example, like that the, the local handmade brick in, in uh, rural uh, South India actually were fired using this kind of thinnings from the forest that they have themselves planted and um, cut the branches uh, time to time and used as firewood in order to let the, the tree grow. And I, I started realizing that the making of a building material, the sourcing of a building material, regardless of whether it is brick or stone it was much more when it remained in the human scale, it was much more intertwined with the territory. It was um, these people who made bricks were not only a brick industry, they were also rice farmers. They were also, they were doing it in, in the right seasons when the clay collected. And, and if we don't, we, and when we stopped using these kind of things, they are not able to maintain the holistic, um, health of the territory because 
I, I am assuming that even maybe the rice becomes expensive if 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 the all the different activities that they do are suddenly uh, made to collapse. So a lot of time given in observing all these, uh, the I for, had the good fortune to see that things that um, used to happen just 100 years ago, in some countries they're still happening and you got, get to learn a lot of uh, things through watching it in comparison to how the modern way of doing things uh, does not think sometimes of holistic approach. And it is very much focused on finding efficiency in only one measurement here and another thing there and losing sight of the whole picture. Similarly, you know, I discovered, uh, you know, that uh, how these people who produce lime, and we used to use lime for brick masonry formerly, and now it's all automatically replaced by cement concrete. And that's because we come from architecture schools and we don't know how to use certain other materials. And we automatically, we don't do it deliberately. It's just that every person who makes a small micro decision doesn't realize what the total macro picture uh, and how it is affected due to that. So I started initially, when I started my uh, career, I took a lot of time to observe when I like, and I started realizing that when you look at green rating systems and you look at, uh, and you judge whether a stone is uh, ecological or not, or I keep hearing this kind of uh, very quantitative measurements of efficiency and not qualitative. And I see that makes a whole lot of difference whether the stone that is extracted in a human scale, uh, what impact does that have compared to uh, the, the way it is extracted with in a large quarry? And I realized that probably the human scale aspect is one of the very big, um, the scale of things is being not, uh, not looked at correctly in the, in the way we are rating what is green or not green. And I, I mean, anyway, in my early years, I started when I say critically examining local materials and local skills, I, I produced, uh, I tried to uh, respond to contemporary design demands and uh, use engineering somehow uh, and the ingenuity to be able to use you know, self-supporting and um, minimal material, but with a lot of knowledge um, and a lot of uh, uh, sort of, I, I try to, when I say critically examine a local material, I also mean to, to, to revisit it and use it with the latest technological, uh, you know, capacities that humans today probably have, and therefore probably can manage to use far less of it. Uh, and, and, and through those sort of applications and explorations, I, I try to not focus on the new building material, but on putting time tested materials together in new ways, first of all. So that that was one of my one of the strategies. I think there is a lot of potential for that uh, in the future. You know, this is a very high end store, uh, and uh, you you can. Uh, it was it was done as an installation, and so it it these dry cobblestone type technology it allowed us to interlock stone slabs. By and and the weight of it. Um, in, in dry dry masonry that we were able to pull all this out when we move and reuse those various slabs. So similarly, I realized that a lot of times one of the hurdles you face is when you try to take a material that is available on the spot, even on the site. Often we are told that um, it's going to be too expensive. You cannot, uh, the stone is like literally if you dig, you find the stone and you are told that this, this will be too expensive because of being time intensive. So I, I mean, I, when I went into the nitty gritty of it, I realized that often investing in time was not costlier at all. One had to just um, get into the details to, to 
decide and not to automatically say time is money and dismiss everything that would take a little bit more time on the human side because i'm thinking of if it took a little more time to make but if it's going to last many many more years over generations and cause a little impact then why are we shying away from investing the time you know and and when you each project you do you become faster and faster at it so so this kind of approach and may if, uh, you know uh, encourage me to go on and as i went along i um i started looking at not only combine not only um, using what is being made already in the place and trying to dig deeper and discover like these handmade bricks that are were still being made in that area i also started combining technologies also critically and sometimes producing things which maybe in that region i mean this is not how people built really in south india um, um but the like i said the needs are contemporary there is a new engineering um, applied to age old materials in order to enable some very um, exciting combination of uh, intelligent uh, but handcrafted and you know negotiating the the degree to which handmade and machine made can coexist so some of these uh, images here uh, i'm just going to run through them show me show uh, me try you know working a little bit with local potters communities and noticing wherever there were skills sometimes but maybe we have to introduce a new product so in this case you know the there was pottery in the region the clay was suitable people were making pots that nobody wanted to buy in the future because oh, oh, formerly they made probably cooking pots and i thought that instead of urbanization uh, threatening their livelihood it would be great if we can come up with new products that they could make so that urbanization could guarantee their livelihood instead and so um, you know we started producing in the local context in the local way but upgrading um you know not trying to produce terracotta now in the factories but keeping it in the way they do alongside their rice fields with their coconut shells etc producing high quality products with which with much more um, clever engineering uh, you could create uh, more interesting roofs which are insulating that are self supporting that don't require any wooden structure below or any steel or whatever and um and yet um may being made with the thinking hand of the people and artisans already on the spot so in fact this was uh, my very first project 30 years ago 1991 um and this is what i mean by negotiating handmade and machine made and making sure that it's the most uh, clever thing you can imagine at that moment uh, because i think a lot of lot of um in sustainability uh, there is a lot of i mean reducing waste is a very important strategy but also over designing of over engineering making things using a lot of material because when we don't have the knowledge and you want to feel safe you tend to waste a lot of materials so i i realize that this uh, if you really invest in knowledge there is a huge scope of saving materials but also there is a huge scope of complementing your knowledge with the knowledge of others in in an interdisciplinary way and so even though i was quite young at that point i think or maybe because i was uh, i managed to you know very seamlessly work with a whole lot of other people and complement with other um other experienced people from other fields like masons and you know craftsmen etc and people uh, uh who, ceramists and you know just asking whoever could help and check that this material we are trying to produce is it good quality and and just reaching out to other people of other disciplines and um building that community uh, while building buildings 
So this is uh, an example of, uh, you know, the house that I later built for myself, in fact, to experiment more. But also in the making of it, I realized that even in terms of... You know, in terms of the traditional cooking pot, about eight or 10 years later, I, I discovered that even the actual pot that they were doing could be used actually to create very intelligent uh, concrete slabs. And I, start, I, I used to keep getting ideas and, you know, so the building knowledge uh, led to building community, knowing more people in the community led to more ideas. And, you know, it kept going into many, many expansions. And here, for example, you see a filler slab system where terracotta is used as a lost form work to be able to cast very efficient concrete slabs that uh, save about 35 to 40 percent of steel. I mean, you can take away two bars out of three uh, because of this kind of system. And uh, many of these things were first uh, tested in my own house that I showed you because uh, I had the capacity to, I mean, I had the opportunity to uh, test at my own experience, uh, own, own expense, and, uh, you know, be more adventurous and risky. But yes, I think in principle, there is a lot of potential for experimentation. And um, I think uh, any, any technology that has any minimum chance to succeed, uh, to, to have any hope, give any hope even if it has a 10% chance to be relevant, it should be explored. So with that motto, I was actually proceeding to produce a certain kind of uh, architecture. And here you see, there are many, many experiments here, even the ferro cement doors, I will come back to ferro cement later, those large louver screens. These are all things that I have been experimenting. So um, yes, again, uh, the materials, the, the architecture is very contemporary, but the materials and the hands of the people of the place who leave the fingerprint, it connects the architecture to the place. And now I kind of use that as an actual strategy where, uh, where I really want to anchor architectural projects in the place through this kind of um, immediacy of relationship of you know of local local materials and local skills so these are just going i'm just going to browse through a couple of other houses in urban areas without explaining them to show the you know public institutional buildings and daycare this is a daycare center for example um you know th th there are different combinations of machine made handmade in the, all these uh, often very socially um social type projects and because uh, of the type of people i was trying to help through the architecture i was very much uh, i had to very much household the way i spend the money and even in uh, buildings like this hostel um, youth hostel or the town hall complex which is going to follow there was uh, oftentimes um, buildings were used a lot of uh, concrete, but uh, again, it was not for me a question of judging whether it is mud versus concrete uh, battle. It was more about using materials judiciously, knowledgeably in a celebration of, of uh, you know, human potential to, to be clever, you know? and yet not compromise on a certain quality of beauty and uh, poetry even. So this is, uh, this is a library very with a humble budget. It includes braille books. So there are some experiences made with round wood construction as well. And in fact, what I can say here now, um, because I was trying to work as I told you, I gave a lot of importance to engineering in order to find out what is sustainable is because it came down to not building knowledge about building and engineering can be the main vehicle I feel in the future to be able to not spend more just because you don't know. 
how to be uh, how to learn and empower oneself in every project and if you don't go in the area where you don't know you'll never push the boundary so how how can we safely experiment that was one question on the other hand even this kind of structure which may look this was my first hut i left bombay i built this for myself uh my own personal experience with affordability to be able to afford to not work for in certain companies and not to work, do certain kind of jobs but uh, liberate my time to think about the future of society the my own future and what what kind of life i want to create what kind of career i want to have so i simplified my needs but uh, when we when when i lived 10 long years well while i was i had a practice and i was building those buildings i was living actually like this with a solar panel on my roof uh the water being recycled from the shower directly all low tech ways uh just very simple simple uh, way of sustainability just like many other people in india lived uh, you know very simply i i followed that and um what i even here if you actually see what the exercise was for me even though it looks like a typical hut was actually the recognition that uh, round wood round wood if it is established as a building material as opposed to timber if you use the whole round cross section you can harvest the tree maybe in this case some of these branches were 3 years old as opposed to maybe 25 years old if you have to cut out the same amount of section you know out of a bigger tree and these these are also time constructs when i talk about slow and fast in architecture i mean if you want to really plan your reforestation etc i was interested in all of these experiments and uh, since it was my own house i was able to um try to also question before i tell other people to reduce the not only to supply whatever demands people want sustainably but also question the demand size what do we really need and i wanted to myself ask myself you know how permanent should a house be what do we really need you know in this kind of house you question the permanence because you know your coconut leaves on the roof has to be every 3 years it has to be changed but not the whole structure the structure doesn't have just one lifetime the thatch has a 3 year life cycle the wood has another one the ropes with which it's tied will be replaced after 10 or 20 years etc and if you protect and change your roof every 3 years you won't need to change the rope because you protected it and so understanding the complexity in the simplicity i would say so this brings me also to another strategy that i also realized uh, i was looking at that time um very much at affordability because i felt that the typical commodified housing unit is not within the reach of most people and so we were looking at participation of course it's a much used word uh, today uh, we we were looking at to what extent technologies could alienate people from participating in their construction even in the even in a urban context actually um, and it's often only maybe technologies that that prevent people from being involved you know and uh, so through these kind of this project was an urban co-housing sort of uh, um, a lot of you know there are always areas that you can open up to anybody to make you know so not not every one has to be an expert and if you design for allowing that like the rammed earth walls it can actually practically be done by anybody or in this case in this community there was a carpenter in the group of people who were going to inhabit this co-housing and why not design according to the skills available in the community and that that is a very different way of doing architecture but i think it's a very valid way if we want good things to be affordable typical architecture practice does not begin with this type of strategies it begins very top down and um i realized uh, 
in the beginning you make many mistakes because you can have endless meetings if you are a bit too open about <laughs> all these participatory processes but gradually you learn not to fear and not to worry, not to have to be a control freak but you can enrich projects through other minds and so yeah co-housing itself is a, already a good start to uh, to propose housing and complement um, different people's um, capacities and uh, try to liberate through the architectural project the reciprocal exchanges that can take place between humans and that's what i mean by uh, investing in people's time and not only via money necessarily and and not only via debt financing and bank loans and all those things so um yeah so here you see some of those kind of houses you know these were also planned to create a sense of community this there were streets on upper levels there are gaps between the street and the house so that the hot air can move out through the venturi effect and there are many many technical things but overall the housing does not um get empowered by the technology you know actually the design aspects are quite invisible and the people the the, it, the people it's a people centric thing the human life and is in the front it's it's in that sense a sense of home i would say and yes there are many areas where compromises have ha happened you know and you may not like all of it but all in all what you can how you can afford it uh is it's it was really a strategy of of participation being fully acknowledged as as a very important resource uh, and unblocking the you know liberate allowing enabling the people's time to be given and to be received in the making of architecture here uh, i want to also uh, explain that as i went along i have I, I was invited to the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2016 uh, by uh, Alejandro Aravena, and we were supposed to give our ideas. Uh, you know, he said reporting from the front, and we were asked to share our approach. And I gave the sketch there, and I just want to explain to you because by that time, I realized that for me the building because i was so much uh, prioritizing knowledge and and people and community that means uh, that means people the human human potential for me is the knowledge as well as community so investing in people investing in knowledge to 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 really urge people to do so i was i made this drawing to explain for me what was architecture and every architectural project was an opportunity to build knowledge and to build community while building buildings so i was explaining that the process of architecture is like the trunk of a tree and the where we synthesize you know our roots seek knowledge in all sorts of disparate directions from climatic concerns to aesthetic concerns uh, building technologies and all sorts of social issues politics all this the frontiers of the root trip tips go wide and wide and deep and deep and the trunk of the tree as architects enables us to synthesize all this knowledge and the expression that comes from the synthesis is actually the fruits that you see and the fruits can have all diverse uh expressions but it this comes from the same tree and i i i was trying to explain my different architecture architectural uh, you know the how the architecture looks which doesn't look like one style but i was trying to explain it through the strategies so i uh, also try to show you my work through the strategies that are about synthesis and holistic thinking integral thinking rather than anything else so again sorry for this duplication some slides i have uh, by mistake not polished excuse me but i just want to explain now a little bit uh, i have explained about uh, a lot about 
not rushing about only trying to create new materials, but also trying to be using age old material in new ways. But I also want to talk about the potential of new materials here. And one of them that I am exploring, which I'll share with you, is ferrocement, where, in, where I feel there is, you can radically reduce the material. And yet you can get uh, strong properties of resilience, of, of ductility, and you know, in the age of uh, climate change with all the disaster relief you're gonna have to prepare for, um, you know, we will need some of these properties. So ferrocement, I think, is uh, as uh, compared to cement concrete, reinforced cement concrete, ferrocement um, actually involves the use of very thin chicken mesh that it's distributed uniformly to, through very, very thin elements. So in reinforced cement concrete, if you want to have a bigger span, you use more steel bars, you make bigger deep sections. And at some point, the weight of the beam is heavier than uh, you know, for that span, and you think it's counterproductive. But in ferrocement, it's the opposite principle. So the same materials, cement, sand, steel, are used in a very different uh, engineering um, concept where you do not increase the material as the span gets bigger. You just fold it and bend it, and you, you use it for its thinness. So the form and shape gives it strength. So you use... I was very, I'm very attracted to the littleness of the material and the cleverness and the excitement for architects and with what the fun you can have with the form when you know that form is actually giving strength to it. So all these explorations that I have done by creating boxes, by folding edges to give stiffening, you know, this, this is a modular housing made in ferrocement. Although I said, you know, taking time, this house can be put up in a week and these elements can be made in a month and what you saw before are in the in the backyards of Mason's homes, uh, everybody can make a couple of elements whenever they are free on Saturday, Sunday, after hours when they need to earn some money, they can teach the people around them to do it. It's a do it yourself sort of prefabrication, not requiring any overheads of a factory, but the colors are embedded, the cement floors, the stucco like finishes, allow you to rapidly put it up in a, in a week, this house. But the study of it took me years, you know? So I, I, the taking time is like, it doesn't mean that the solution will be slow. But if you don't make the time to invent something new or to develop your own knowledge, you will never, uh, you will always be in a hurry and not be able to ever solve the real big problems that we have. And that's why I see 30 years later, People are still in a hurry and they're not, like when I graduated in Bombay, they kept feeling that all the same problems we talk about were already there. But 30 years later, I asked myself, what did we do except let it grow and overwhelm us even more? So yeah, I, I, whereas on the other hand, I do see, it reminds me of the hare and the tortoise that if you just do slow, 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 and you don't get disturbed if you're taking time, at some point, slow and steady does win the race. Um, because at least you know where you're going. So yeah, so these, this is that system of modular housing in ferrocement that I have done and also showed at the Venice Biennale where you see that not only have I done a lot of research by this stage in ferrocement, I also collaborated uh, years later and this sort of thing takes really years. I keep on building on the knowledge, investigating. I want, didn't have the budget to to test my, uh, I, I knew it worked, but it was empirical. I couldn't test, uh, I didn't have the money for the research findings, but later I went to, with the Biennale budget sort of, got the Indian masons to produce, not only with steel, but to go, to, but with, with natural fibers, carbon fiber, glass fiber, with Mike Schleich and the German laboratory uh, with Aunt Goldak and uh, engineering professors to be able to really, really, you know, take it further, 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 make it lighter, 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 you know, and feel more confident each year about those sort of radical experimentation. I, it, I get, got more and more courage to produce this kind of toilet units, bigger spans. This can be assembled, for example, in a day. And it is affordable, like, you know, um, 
because it, 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 you know, in that sense, if you build light and you build fast, there are automatically some savings. This is a, an example of the process behind what I explained, you know, that the Indian craftsmen have been are working here in the German laboratory. I was giving a workshop to engineers to enable all of this. And we made the pieces that would go later, one set to the Biennale, another set remains here, gets cured, gets measured. And we see, look at this, I was so impressed how it doesn't crack, it bends. So I know that it can, it's uh, the seismic relevance is already, you know, it, it requires a lot more testing, but still it was really interesting. You know, this, this object we put up in full scale in the Venice Biennale has, you can see some pieces have got circular cutouts and these show different meshes that we used in the Teu Berlin, but only six Six of these pieces were authentic ferrocement. All the rest were cement boards uh, recycled from the previous Biennale. We made the whole exhibition out of recycling the material from another one and in, uh, create the scenography. And um, later we went and, you know, uh, also made a third cycle of its own use. We dismantled it and built a, uh, 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 expansion for a refugees community in the outskirts of Venice in the subsequent year. So the material just passed through us before us and after us, it was something else. But anyway, you can see the kitchen is, uh, is built in the furniture, the space that you gain by folding, you need to fold these thin sheets, right? To make it rigid. And that space was ergonomically designed to have a lot of storage space that very tiny houses need. So here, um, unfortunately, I don't think I have a picture of, of that. In fact, uh, we collaborated with IAC here and uh, I couldn't find that image, but uh, when we displayed this, we, IAC had an, um, created an installation for us that people who uh, we could on the floor, uh, whenever anybody tweeted about housing, affordability, this and that, technology, whatever keywords we had, you could see it live on the floor in the dark space, you know? And that's what we collaborated with IAC to do. Um, that was, sadly, I haven't included that picture, I have to mention. And then there are other examples where I've applied ferrocement to, to create huge savings in concrete. Like this is a purely concrete structure. And so a lot of sustainability people will think this is not sustainable, this building, okay? But for me, the aim was to try to reduce a hundred. I wanted the building to be so open and strong and timeless as a community center where no, there were no doors, everybody could claim and use. 125 cubic meters of concrete got reduced to 75 cubic meters of concrete because of the way the columns were leaning in, the way the beams were shaped because of ferrocement lost form work that I made. So because, you know, I found out when I was studying concrete that a lot of concrete wastage happens because people are uh, afraid about the form work that shells and intelligent structures require. So they tend to just straighten out all the edges and use much more volume of concrete that makes the columns heavy, that makes the beams heavy, that makes the foundation heavy. And uh, I, I wanted to enable that somehow. So I have, I feel those are also kind of invisible technologies uh, that like loss shuttering, et cetera. One has to look into those. So some images of that sort of work. Yeah, you see how the ferrocement, uh, a very thin beam is being hand lifted and then they are going to turn it around and the beam is going to pour, be poured in it. And then you don't even have to take it down. And that, that one thing, decision, made us save almost 50 cubic meters of concrete. And then there is one other um, a radical, more radical experimentation that I have done. I would put it in that bracket of new materiality so here, what we are trying to do is we are trying to cook mud houses in situ. We're building a large mud house and we are baking it on the spot because uh, normal bricks, when you make them in an oven, you spend about 
40% of the energy you generate on its own kiln walls. And again and again, that heat gets spent. And Ray Meeker, a Californian ceramist, had pioneered this technology. I did my PhD also on this. I had also built other houses in this technique before, where I found it very attractive that you build a mud house completely with mud bricks if the site on the ground is good for making bricks rather than rammed earth because a different earth again. And if you design it first as a kiln, you see in the base, there are some holes to put the firewood and all that and to get oxygen in. And you fill, this, this is going to first, in its first stage, act as a mud house. But the thing is that the mortar is also mud. You don't need cement even. Fire is the cement. So I found it very attractive actually, where to look upon the house, not as a consumer of building materials, but a, 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 as a producer of materials for the region, that if while making your house, you got all this many bricks out of it, not only bricks, you can put in tiles, wash basins, what uh, all, you know, there's a lot of cement, uh, ceramic we use. I mean, we need water, we can have tiles, we can glaze them, don't glaze them. You know, you, you, we use a lot of ceramic for, for a lot of things in architecture and uh, it can be seen as part and parcel. Of course, it is a technology which is very much in its infancy, I would say, but I think these are all the ideas of how some further future researchers could go if we were to look upon the human, look at technologies from the human in relationship to the material procurement in the, how, it, how the human deals with technology and so on, and be able to have houses after working for eight to 10 hours a day it's not possible that some people cannot have basic health care. I understand if they're not working, but after working, the urban poor is not able to afford housing because it's more than 60% of their salary, even to rent. So here was the outcome of that technology, you know, made with a lot of other waste and so on. It's, uh, these are, it's called voluntary at homes for homeless children. And as you see, yes, the architecture is often the result of just the actual universal laws of things like gravity and all that. You have, if you face all of that, uh, you have to surrender and let the form emerge through the utility and the technology. So Another area where I will explain a little bit what I started uh, with another EAC project. Uh, here I'm talking about the potential for you direct reuse of urban waste, you know, whether it is uh, um, magazines, books, whatever, you know, glass bottles, anything. I, um, I was doing this project, uh, I was invited to produce a pavilion in um, in Barcelona um, by um, by Benedetta Taliabue, who was curating BC and Reset, and I was given IAC as a partner, and uh, we were uh, supposed to make one pavilion in 2014 at um, Plaza Salvador Segui near Filmoteca. So I started a research with books because that project was called Library of Lost Books, and I wanted to see how could I use a vernacular technology to spend the books that, uh, you know, every country discards in huge amounts. In Spain, they get burnt, in other countries, they get pulped and so on, you know. And I, in Spain, of course, when I was just, I landed in Spain, I was, I, I encountered all the jamón and all the vacuum packed, you know, the things. And I, I thought it was a nice vernacular technology to, use this, actually this was the collaborative idea that Areti, uh, Silvia have actually also uh, uh, produced with the students over there. So we decided to use the books that had to be, uh, the obsolete books that had to be discarded because, and make a canopies out of it because, uh, you know, and to be able to create spaces for reading and put the attention on uh, the need for knowledge and uh, to interpret liberty as a theme I was given, uh, that knowledge makes you free beyond politics and all that, 
you know, to, to develop the consciousness and um, establish a common ground because actually we are all connected. And uh, through that collaboration, you know, see, this is the structure we have produced. You will all recognize the space and um, you might find all of some of the people from the school in this, among this, it was the inauguration day. But you will also see how, again, uh, you know, the, the unit which is combined in a kind of decentralized strategy, reflection of the cobblestones on the ground as well, to see that beyond geometries, a rectangular unit becomes a circular, etc. And, you know, to play with all those elements. But anyway, this was a very, very fun memory for me. I had to share it with you. But also look at other things of that sort that I have done, which were like this, you know, we have made uh, with glass bottles, uh, wine bottles, actually, in a previous Biennale, which Chipperfield had coordinated, because I had built my wall house in one to one scale, but I wanted to test the same roofing idea with other materials like so these are just examples of what we are doing with broken glasses or, you know, just looking at what including what you find and wherever you can absorb them in building, including form work. Again, uh, that, that project I showed you formally was shaped by bicycle wheels so that all the windows cost like less than, I think five or 10 euros, I suppose, um, to do the form work. And of course you have to adjust then your windows according to what you find. And this is part of it to spend a lot of time with uh, students going to sites you know to learn to to always think of recycling them these are this uh, this this is the refugee in uh, collaboration that i spoke about in the third cycle of the venice biennale you know to be able to have all these human exchanges and so on this is in mexico we are repacking this very complex material to allow for its direct reuse filling it with water building what we can, but also for students to 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 build, you know, to build one to one. Okay, I think I'm going to now quickly wrap up this uh, part. I, I I'm sorry that that, that uh, I think I've taken a bit too long. I'm just going to show you images. I think I've explained them. This is ferro cement being used uh, on the basis of origami crease patterns so that you can actually cast it on paper for some housing units with so little mesh. And here, I want to just slowly bring you to, to the kind of engineering efficiency that are seen even in the way you span concrete in the, you know, like I said, I explained how much potential there is to build very lightly, even with the heavy materials. So this is the town hall complex in Oroville. Okay. Now, I will just mention one last point is to summarize everything I said, that if you, if we invest in human resources, that means human, advancing human knowledge, allowing to develop the human brain, human muscles, time, everything, you won't lead to any waste or any pollution. We will only become more clever, more fit, more everything. And at the same time, for students, it's, for me, it's very important that I can allow and enable or facilitate a one-to-one -one exchange with real materials, real scale, real people, and real place during the learning of a studio, at least through a 10-day workshop or things like that. So you will see a lot of opportunities where the thinking hand can be in integrated while we go more and more digital, it is more and more important to go analog so that our experiential intelligence can, can feed into the only mental way of doing things. So this is, these are some images of the EAC students. You will recognize your space and the properties they develop. And here you see other installations being done in Segovia and in other schools, okay? Um, I had wanted to um, uh, say something about Oroville, but I'm going to uh, skip this because I've taken way too long. But I wanted to say that I am, I think there is, uh, there are places in the future of city building 
where the human potential is put in the center of the whole purpose of why cities are being built. And Auroville is one such place. And I uh, just wanted to say that a lot of projects I showed you were located in this context where a city has come on a barren land uh, based on a great vision um, to be a prototype city for the future in which everything like mobility, infrastructure, energy, everything has been radically rethought. And I've been associated with Roger Angers um, and learned a lot from him in, in uh, having lived there for many years and working through this perspective for future cities. I will end with a few images of what is going on uh, or what I'm still working on, uh, alternative to tower typology for high density co-housing and uh, working with other experts like Jan Gehl. But um, with all these type of, um, you know, especially the last project I showed, it has been shown in um, this exhibition of mine, by the way, it got extended to 15th of May. And I hope some of you will have the time to visit, taking time and the, all the research that I have produced over three decades has been shown here through material palettes, through all this inquiry of one to five scale tectonic models and one to 50 scale spatial models to show spatial research alongside material research and the synthesis of the two. You will see a lot of, uh, and, the, and that's project that I explained is produced in one to 50 scale in collaboration with students from Yale University where I was teaching and uh, Potsdam and KADK in Denmark. And the facade, uh, which you will, uh, you know, uh, here see in one to one scale, we have produced humane houses to show the, that uh, what is possible, how to keep the human scale, but also the face of the buildings are very radically rethought. There's urban farming, uh, recycled, uh, upcycling, um, energy generating um, facades, uh, you know, not only through photovoltaic, but also through those paints and so on. All these ideas we have for future, the architecture of the future uh, have been shown there. And so I would like to uh, encourage all of you to invest in time and not to glorify time saving, but freely spend time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anupama. You are always inspiring. So I would like to give the floor now to Fabio. Uh, that he will manage some Q and A, uh, maybe from IAC students and also from students from all over the world. So far, yeah. go ahead, please. Sure, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nabama, for the presentation. It was wonderful, really inspired. Uh, maybe I don't know who wants to start with the questions. Um, also, you could uh, use the reaction button. Oh yeah, Rita, go ahead. Uh, hi, Nabama. Uh, I'm Amrita, I'm from India, and Chennai to be specific. I'm uh, here at IAC doing uh, MAEB. Um, so I am a huge fan of your work to start with, and I really like your approach and how you see time and how you uh, use that as doing more rather than finding excuse. I really like that. And also how you see technology, how you associate that with the local human scale and uh, not to make and to make it more affordable that way and that i guess is the most sustainable approach and i really really like that um i know you have started I've, uh, you started your base from oroville uh, by, um, in your experimentations is that right yes uh, so uh, i think um with my knowledge of oroville it's a very uh, it's a space with a lot of freedom for you to go ahead and do, but how would you, uh, uh, you know, advise in approaching an already existing city, probably for example, Chennai in my case, it's already existing. And how would, and I'm, I would love to have this approach in that city, but how would you look at that? See, first of all, it's not only Auroville that shaped me, it's Bombay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's not only Aurovillians who shaped Auroville. It were people from France, people from Chennai 
one of the people who really, really worked with us is uh, uh, Mr. Dattatri, who was a chief town planner of, of Chennai for, for, for the longest time. And he helped us to make this town accepted in the Ta Tamil Nadu. It, it falls in Tamil Nadu. So, you know, it's not something, it was not meant to be something elitist. It's just that the central government and the local government and all the people, it's a, not a project that belongs to our civilians. It's a project that belongs to the whole world. In fact, the project was defined as a city the earth needs. I got called there like anyone else who wants to work on the topic of how should humans be living in the future without creating a complication for themselves and the other people who also live on the earth. So there is already, there were projects like this, you know, which, which had such a incredible vision. See, there is not only something that the world can learn from Oroville or Chennai, even we can learn from Chennai. You know, Chennai has got the concept of Perambuk, which is of, uh, of not ownership of land, okay, of, of the commons, okay? I, I, I'm fascinated by that. Oroville has uh, probably for me, why Oroville was, at, was the radical first and foremost, is that there is no place I've heard of where people want to build a city without ownership. And the world is getting there slowly on other aspects, but it was there in some form also in Tamil Nadu. So I don't, I didn't see it that way. I think I feel that there is, uh, we as humans uh, are probably focusing too much on our, um, differences rather than our commonalities. I think we have, we are all a collective. We have to zoom out and see that we are part, even as architects, of a large collective action in time and space. And we have to see where we are. We have to assume our irrelevance and also our significance. And I think we, uh, so it's not like uh, that I feel, yes, I was, uh, I want to learn from everywhere. I have learned uh, from a lot of things I took from Oroville, okay? But I've also taken a lot of things from everywhere else. And I live in um, outside Oroville, I was uh, two, two more, 15 years, half the, uh, of that 30 years, you know? And I feel it's all connected. If, if there would be uh, no global problems, Oroville would not be envisioned. And we are not supposed to go to Oroville to flee from the world and just stay in the greenery. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, it, it really did give me a, a better perspective of it because um, I've always aimed to achieve what you said, but I remember getting in uh, for an internship in there and my professor said, go there, very good experience. You come back into the city, it's hard for you to practice. This is what I was told. And that really was... Uh, I don't know what it was. It was not something I expected. So it's nice to- People you know, will tell you all kinds of things and yeah. there will be the same number of people who will tell you the opposite. And you That's know, true. a lot of what we find depends on what you're looking for. So we just use the outside people to validate what is inside. Mm -hmm. So you have to, what you identify you want, you just should go for it. And you will find all the people who will suddenly be telling things which help. That's true. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Now let's see who, who else would like to. Okay, I have I have a couple of questions in chat. Maybe I will go with those. I have uh, one. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah, please. <laughs> go ahead, Marita. Well. Um. So hello, Anupama, thank you for your presentation. It was amazing. Um, so you talk about two types of technology from what I understood. The ones that can alienate people and participation processes in building and the ones that can be rethought and literally built from the ground up. Um, so in this context, do you think that technological advances have changed the way architecture is being taught and therefore how people are designing and and if you do then um what impact do you think this has okay first of all uh, please don't mind but i want to rephrase the way you said what i categorized two type of technology actually i didn't categorize two type of technology what i was trying to say is that technology even i don't agree with the category of high tech and low tech technology means 
how materials or how things are brought together that is technology you know uh, that is for me technology so that is not a judgment it's it we are living in a polarized world so we like to make everything black and white sometimes you know and i think therefore we feel a bit lost when in the gray zone because we don't know how light gray dark gray whatever but i think technology is not good or bad it's uh, there is not a moral is we should not have a moral approach to green and all that i feel uh, that even now with digital technology see there are some people who will use it and there will be some people who will misuse it okay there are people who will take very ancient ways of doing things and they can be very authoritarian about it or they could be very oppressive about it so it's all about using things and it's the consciousness i'm talking about i'm talking about every person decides we should not standardize for every child how many hours he can be on a phone it depends how you are addicted or not i mean it's it depends what you want to do with, with it and i learned that even from glen mercat in fact i thought he he didn't no i should not tell this private but i i think people use the technologies people who are um living consciously they will use all the technologies consciously and keep on trying to use and not misuse that's all i meant okay you you understand me or am i sort of okay absolutely yeah. yeah right i love i love all technologies actually i i love intelligence of humans so if somebody misuses it i will not want to question the blame the technology because the technology is not a person great great very very clear <laughs> thank you uh, who else would like to to share his or her thought with the um, i have another i have a question for you anubama Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, your work is really inspiring me. Um, so I, I met you one year ago in the opening of, of the architect studio at the Louisiana. I don't know. I think oh, yeah? you don't remember me, but I remember you very good. Oh, so and, sorry. And I really like the, the exhibition that you made. But my question will be in, in countries like Mexico or India, where we don't have like sometimes the resources you think to be to make um, architecture in a sustainable way might be to study the indigenous and the way of um, communities built since a long time ago yeah i think we should everybody should study everything whatever they can they have to there is not necessarily one formula i would say i think when people graduate from institute they shouldn't stop learning first of all you know If, if if what what makes you learn something is your curiosity you can go to the most famous school and you could not maybe do something any learning over there uh, you may come out with a degree or you may go nowhere and you learned a lot so i think it's about really the judgment we should not use uh, education or let's say misuse education to come out with every degree and feel like we know less and less compared to what there is to be known you know Uh, so the, 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 we have to manage the uncertainty uh, be certain within the uncertainty you know uh, this is what is a life life question actually more than an architectural question and i think everywhere before we existed people have always had shelter they have always even the birds and bees are uh, stitching their uh, nests and doing uh, everybody's building shelter we are not the only one but we have uh, there are many ways of doing something in our times what became problematic is maybe the way we have defined shelter to be we made so much bureaucracy we made so many uh, complicated things that we cannot build like the birds and bees freely even though we have done so in the past and then we are we are like prisoners of our own device somehow as they say and then maybe we have to do also some unlearning and maybe so it's something like in india mexico you are mentioning i just feel that everywhere regardless of whether you are a developed country or a developing country or whether you are industrialized or not industrialized the same force of gravity is acting on all of us you know 
and it's not so different. I mean, the, we are all homo sapiens, you know, uh, technology has changed, but our biology didn't change in 100 years. We are pretty much the same. We have the same needs. I went to Mexico and I, I, I feel our feelings are the same, our needs are same. Maybe in some country you need to make it hot, some, uh, your room's heated somewhere, you need to cool it, but that's not because we are different. That's because the homo sapiens needs one degree of temperature, which is a thermal comfort, but then in some country it's cold and somewhere it's hot, so we adapt. But actually our needs are same. And I think uh, I don't see any difference here and there, you know. I think sometimes the difference in the developing country is our own maybe inferiority complex or something that we feel if somebody from out there validates it, then, we, then the technology is good. Maybe we have this pro pro problem. Thank you so much. Great. Um, now, Mina asked in the chat that in the process of experimenting with new materials, how are you able to make the final product architecturally good looking? How much importance do you give to making a beautiful form? 100% importance, okay? But I don't start with looking for beauty just like in a makeup way, you know? I like to reveal the true deep beauty inside the truth of things. Actually, I would like to quote uh, Buckminster Fuller here, who said that uh, somebody asked him this kind of question. And he said that I never start a project trying to make a, an architecture beautiful. But when I finish the design, if it's not beautiful, that means I have not finished the process. I think when you achieve the real harmony of an integrated synthesis, then it's always going to you. I mean, beauty is not something, uh, if a thing is not beautiful, it means that uh, things have not harmonized. I similarly feel that when you create something and we don't agree, the process is not over. I hope it satisfies. <laughs> but yes, beauty is very important. It's very important for the soul. Great. I have another question that actually sent to me. It says, we have seen a shift in your work from India to elsewhere in the world. What role did human, human skill and efficiency play in that shift? Oh, uh, I didn't quite understand. Can, can you tell me the second part again? Maybe? Yeah, sure, sure. I will read it again, the whole, the whole question. Okay. We have seen a shift in your work from India to elsewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. What role did human skill and efficiency play in that shift? I don't, uh, I mean, I don't get driven by efficiency. Uh, we, we all have to define for ourselves what is efficiency or what is success. You know, for somebody's success may be money, for somebody's success may be fame. Uh, uh, for, for me, success is, and, and efficiency is like if I spend my life fruitfully, you know, and if I feel good about my day and my work and my everything, you know, I, so for me, uh, I don't think there was a real shift, maybe, uh, I don't see personally a difference in the way I work here or there or wherever I have lived. I really, in fact, the more I traveled, I only realized that I, we are more common than we are different. This is what I felt wherever I went. And that's why I'm feeling at home in Berlin. I don't think I'm doing anything different except wearing many jackets with the snow. Uh, but this is not the main thing. I think I have not, I think I, I told you that I showed that slide about that quote I gave that there is no, nothing more useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. I don't, I like to question the whole reason why am I doing this or why am I doing this project? I ask myself, what will I get if I do this? I, I think there are many buildings that come to me. I feel it should not be built at all. So I don't do it. That, that's the way I've done. So I, I unfortunately cannot show you all the portfolio of all the things I didn't do. I would have loved to make such a portfolio. <laughs> so I, I didn't do the, I'm very much defined by the things I didn't do, not only what I did. Great. Now, maybe we, we don't have much, much more time left, but we can, we can let Ellie, who raised her hand to ask uh, the, the last question. Hello. Thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to ask a question actually 
more about the legislation according to this experimental way of trial and error that you've used so that you can have new materials, which are very incredible, actually. And uh, I'm, very f I'm not quite so familiar, but I have heard of some uh, methods like this that were used, for example, in uh, Central America or even the Mesogean. But I wanted to make an image in my head of how this kind of experimentation could work, for example, in Central Europe. Uh, for example, in Germany, as you said that you teach there, if I correctly understood. So that the legislation is so strict, for example, and maybe the bureaucracy is also very high uh, uh, developed. So that maybe such experimentation will take so much time so that they can be authorized by the state to be actually used in some buildings. And I would like to ask for your opinion about that and how we could maybe but tackle this i think you already gave the answer yourself when you said it'll take a lot of time and all those things but you see since i'm not afraid of that i'm more worried if i'm not doing anything about a problem that i see i don't mind if i'm doing something about it and it takes time because at least it has one percent chance to to go somewhere so you see who made all these laws you know who made all the laws and don't you think laws are changing every day do you remember, I don't know, you were too young, when they decided not to allow smoking in all the bars, even in Spain, I thought this is not going to go through. But next day, people stop smoking. The next day, it's we who made the law, we made the law. And by the way, everybody everywhere has been complaining about the norms and the norms that are not letting uh, it. So if you listen to only the difficult news, you get discouraged, but you should look for the good news. And maybe you get encouraged, like, look, you know, earth construction was in most countries not available, uh, not, not authorized. All this authorizing business, which started after industrialization, was because the new materials needed tests and they got authorized. And there were codes to control how industrial materials are being used to, to bring safety and all. The, it's all for good reason, okay? But all bylaws are always being reviewed. For mobility, they have allowed the car to take a back seat in most, most cities and made space for the pedest pedestrian and bicycle. Look at Copenhagen. The laws allowed it. I love the uh, urban governance aspect because if we all don't participate and make that kind of policy, it won't happen. When I came to Berlin, it was unaffordable to eat organic food. And today it is almost the mainstream it's, it's so normal you know and this are all made by all of us and yes it took time but look 30 years later i'm, I'm living in the same place and i i thought this organic food is so elitist it's never going to get through but look all, all all that is happening but had we if we don't start the process because we're afraid it'll take time that's why my title take time do the right thing because then your whole life will become worth living. I mean, Grenoble took, uh, created Crater, the institute who made mud construction and all kinds of technologies, years of research, all of them in the norms. And they are the ones who can build now with that. But every day I see new materials getting included in the norm. Why? Because the industry and there are people backing that information, but nobody is championing certain natural materials, they are seen as vernacular material. They are there for 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 years, and still they are doubted if they will stand with gravity, but the modern material not. So if you believe in it, um, do it. It's, uh, who said it's going to be all easy, you know? New stuff is never easy. Uh, great, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think, yeah, Vicente, go ahead. No, yes. Uh, thank you, Fabio. Thank you, Anupama. Your lecture was completely um, inspiring. We have uh, our students living in Baidaura in a place where they can make bricks and they can manage wood. And I'm sure they are thinking what to do next. Uh, what is fantastic. I mean, stimulating people, young people is always great. Your, your work is, really is very inspiring. I have been looking during your lecture to Auraville, uh, also to see this idea of uh, radical or 
a kind of mix between utopia and reality that this is something that we we like very much so thank you Anu anupama we are waiting for you in barcelona you are always we welcome here and we love you uh, from yak uh, so thank you very much for your talk i love you too thank you and and really, please don't think that we only have to advance, uh, yes, all the natural materials and all that, yes. But really, I would like to uh, do the, the, the modern technologies also with the same excitement and, you know, a collaboration, you know. So I, I personally enjoy, therefore, to work with IAC and, uh, yeah, look forward to next collaborations. Thank Good. you, all of you, for stimulating me with all these questions. Yeah. And thank stay you. in touch, Instagram, whatever. Bye. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.